Howdy. So, I was going to basically do this on two subjects, but now it's going to be a video about three because I just have to touch upon this. By the time this goes out, which will be Wednesday, um, of course everyone knows by now that Muhammad Ali passed away Friday night at the age of 74. And Ali was one of those people who, he wasn't a perfect man, but I'm sorry to say he was a great man. No, you're right, I'm not sorry to say that. Ali was a great man. Ali did a bunch of wonderful things for a bunch of people around the world for basically almost 40 years. I'm not going to you know, say that he did much for people in those early years, but he actually did do a standard. Yes, he became this Muslim, which was very controversial at the time. He did decide that he wasn't going to go into the draft, and the Supreme Court basically backed him up later on. So people who didn't necessarily like that, y'all all lost, because it was a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court. And, you know, this was a guy who basically was a man of convictions. Now, like I said, he wasn't a perfect man. He did some things and said some things that every once in a while were cringeworthy. I'm not even going to deny it. But this is a guy who, once he basically left boxing, he learned a lot more. He didn't stop learning. And once he learned a few more things and educated himself, he totally became a totally different man, pretty much like Malcolm X did. So I'm going to link at some point here to uh, a blog post that I wrote that actually went out this past Monday uh, giving some thoughts on Muhammad Ali and how he was important in my life and why he was important in my life. And I just had to say something. I didn't want to have to do another <laughs> tribute video like I did with Prince. And, you know, over the weekend, I just, everything I found about Muhammad Ali, I shared on social media. So I, I'm done with that, at least I think I am. We'll find out. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'm going to do, if you saw the thumbnail, you saw that I got another package of Hydrox. Now, the story behind this, and I'm going to link to that video, is last year, I think it was last year, I did a review of Hydrox cookies. They had gone off the market for a good long time, and then suddenly they came back. So I bought a package, and I opened them up during the video, and I tasted them. I smelled them. It didn't taste anything like what I remembered, not even close. And so I did the review of it, and of all things, the Hydrox people saw the video. And they said that they were getting in touch with the original guy who basically made these and that they were going to be changing the formula and making them taste better they recognized that there was something lacking and so I pretty much waited an entire year and I see these all the time next to the Oreos and I said you know what it's been a year let's give it a shot see if they have improved and see what's gone on so here we go it's a food review <laughs> about the Hydra and first I'm going to do the smell test Okay, you know what? They smell better than they did last year. So, that's the first test. I'm opening it up. <laughs> so, there it is. I gotta tell you the truth. I was kind of amazed that as many people, you know, who I didn't think would even know what Hydrox were, there were a lot of people who did know who it was, knew what they were, but there were a whole lot of people who also did their own sampling of it. And they didn't get it. Because they kept saying, well, who are these Hydrox people trying to be Oreos? When the truth of the matter is, it was Oreos that tried to be Hydrox initially. And then they just surpassed them. So, here we go. And this is how I do it. I don't, like, take it apart, although I could. I just put it all in my mouth. So. Okay. It still doesn't taste like... What I remember, but they're a lot better than they were. So you Hydrox people, you definitely have improved your cookie. I'm glad I bought this, and I'm going to enjoy eating these. Um, yeah, this is a lot better than last year. So there you go. This is definitely a quality alternative. If you want something a little different than the Oreos, you guys have done a good job. Thank you for that. Now, let's talk about Oreos for a bit. You know, I don't get a lot of people who ask me a question about certain things, and I'm glad I got one finally because now I have something to kind of talk about that's a little different than the norm. And the question was, do I think that Oreos is going overboard with all these different flavors to the extent that they may be damaging their original brand? 
And I had to give it a little thought because I started to recognize that it's rare that I buy the original Oreos anymore. Um, as I try not to buy all that many cookies, and I really don't buy as many cookies as people think I do, basically I start off with the Oreos mint cookies. So that's not even one of the really new ones, but it is a different version of it. So I will usually start with that, and then every once in a while I get in the mood to buy the cinnamon, which is a newer cookie, and I kind of like that. There are some of the newer cookies that came and went. Uh, the one that I really liked was the key lime pie. I love that one. And that one they didn't they never brought back, but they brought back the lemon, which okay, it's kind of lame. Um, the red velvet, I've never even tried that because I've never had anything else red velvet. The latest cookie I've seen is the s'mores, and I'm really not in the mood because I've never had a real s'mores, and it just didn't look all that appealing in the picture. Uh, in one of my other videos, I mentioned at the end of it that I had tried the fudge, um, was it the cupcake? I think it was the cupcake Oreos, and that was horrible. <laughs> it was just nasty. But let's talk about this thing about brands, and are they doing too much? You know, Oreo is spreading itself out, but they weren't necessarily the only company. Um, the Keebler people did the exact same kind of thing, uh, where now they've even gone back in a thing where they've done something that they call the simple cookie, which is just supposed to be butter and sugar and eggs. And even though that's supposed to be an old formula, it, in essence, is a new flavor that they have. So Keebler has tons of flavors. Um, there's a lot of, matter of fact, a lot of the uh, cookies do. I'm sure there's a lot of people who've heard of the Milano cookies. Well, way back in the day, there were only like maybe two flavors of Milano cookies, and now there's something like nine or ten, and that's only what I see. So there may even be more of that. So this isn't new as far as making all kind of different flavors. And what's interesting is that it didn't start really with cookies. And I'm going off... Uh, some of you people are going to know who Malcolm Gladwell is. This is a very smart guy, very intelligent guy. And he did, I think it was a TED Talk, or it may have just been an interview thing. And he was talking about spaghetti sauce, believe it or not. And he was talking about Ragu and Prego. And Ragu had basically cornered the market early on, and you know they were one of the first companies who was able to make a real success out of making a true spaghetti sauce that people really enjoyed. And so you had the people for Prego who came out and they put out their Prego. And their, their selling point was that their sauce was thicker and it had better ingredients in it. And supposedly, you know, this was the selling point because they had done a lot of market research. And this is the type of thing that people said they wanted. Yet, when they put it out, they found that their product was kind of a bust when compared to Ragu. They just couldn't crack the market. And they said, well, wait, we did everything right. And they had no real idea of what to do. So for whatever reason, they went to Malcolm, and he did some studies, and he came up with a thing, and he said, you need to offer choices. And they didn't get it at first. He said, well, basically, all you've done is you've come up with one thing that is a competitor of Ragu, and Ragu is kicking your behind. But what we found out is that people want choices. They don't want just one flavor going against Ragu. Sometimes they want a flavor of maybe onion, and sometimes they want meat or whatever, and I'm just, you know, throwing these things out, but they wanted differences. So the Prego people did come up with four other versions. So now they had five versions, and all of a sudden the market started to turn, and they became as popular as Ragu, and it sometimes passed them, because people liked this idea of having choices. And it didn't necessarily damage their original brand because it hadn't been able to overcome Ragu on its own. But by having all these choices, then they were able to really compete. So what happens? Ragu decides to do the same thing. And they're not the only ones. There's tons of companies that, you know, learn these kinds of lessons. When you think back on it, Chef Boyardee did the same thing. I mean, way back when, you know, I point myself out as being really all this, you know, very old, but I'm not really all that old, uh, you know, in comparison. But when I was a kid, the only thing that I remembered was the spaghetti. I mean, it was the uh, Franco-American or Chef Boyardee, I don't remember who it is. Anyhow, there was the spaghetti, and that's all it was. And then later on, here came beefaroni, and here came ravioli, and here came all these other flavors 
And in essence, it was kind of the same thing when you think about it. You know, SpaghettiOs, SpaghettiOs with meatballs, SpaghettiOs with uh, uh, hot dogs, <laughs> you know. Yet, you gave people choices, and you were able to build up your brand. rice a same thing. Think about how many flavors of rice a there are now. When, way back in the day, you didn't have all these flavors, you know. Soups, yes. Campbell soups always had a bunch of different flavors, but it's soup. And, you know, it just really, this is what people like. People like to have choices. They like to make the selection. And you know that the people who are making these things, they look at the numbers and see how the sales are going. And they'll still make everything, but they're going to make more of the ones that are selling better. And it just gives them a better chance to compete. So is Oreos going nuts and are they messing up their major brand? Probably not. I think that, you know, we, like I said, we all kind of like our choices. So some people like the peanut butter. Some people like the special edition Reese's peanut butter better than the regular peanut butter. Some people are going to like the lemon. Me, like I said, I like the key lime because they had a, a graham cookie that was just absolutely wonderful. They need to just put that out. I said that last year, and I'm going to say that again. Just put out the cookie. If you don't want to put any cream on it, fine. Just put out that cookie. Um, so we like choices. So that's my thought on the Oreo. I haven't looked up any numbers to see if the diff others are you know, overtaking it. But it's pure brand strategy. This is one of the kind of things we talk about in you know, trying to get a web presence, for instance. You don't just do one thing. You don't just blog. You get on either Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever. You try to attack social media in different ways. Uh, my friend earlier today was trying to talk me into doing Periscope. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm never going to do it, but I ain't doing it now. And there's Periscope. There's Snapchat. Uh, uh, is Blab, I think, is still around. I don't know about Meerkat. Um, there's just all these things. There's always something new coming. And some people are trying to do it all. So, you know, people love to have choices. So those are my thoughts. Those are my thoughts on the cookies. I've given you my thoughts on Muhammad Ali. What do you guys have to say? Let me know. I will talk with you later on.